Well, uh, just a couple things I want to share before we jump into the passage. The first thing is family camp is a wonderful thing. So uh, is, is Tina here this morning? Um, there she is, right over there. If you would like to go to family camp next year, please connect with Tina. Uh, the early bird gets the worm, which makes me always wonder, that poor worm. He got up early too. Um, but you don't want to miss out. So, so make sure you connect with Tina. There is something to be said about a changed environment. And I'm going to ask, hey, Sean, could you turn my volume down a little bit? Just to, that way I can yell more freely. Um, no. <laughs> um, I would encourage you to connect with Tina right away and get signed up for family camp. Uh, it's, a, it's, great. it's a great way to build relationships. It's a great way for our kids to build friendships. And it's, it's just a lot of fun. Uh, Fort Stevens is, is a fantastic place. Uh, two Mondays ago, Ron Herbig and I had the chance to go sit with Grace, and uh, what a wonderful opportunity that was for him and I. We got to hear her testimony. She was uh, very lucid. She just had just was conversational, and you know, I was talking to her. She has cancer, and um, and I just asked her point blank, "Are you afraid?" And she said, "Absolutely not." She knew where her hope lied. She knew where she was going, and she was ready to go there. Well, this last week, the Lord called Grace home. And that's a loss for us, but that's a blessing for her. She was ready. So please pray for the family and those that are involved in that. That would be good. And then the other thing I would like to to just share is uh, on October, is it 6th, is Gary and Julie here? I think they are down in Georgia with their son who just graduated, um, uh, I think, is, what is he, Special Forces now or something like that. Uh, so th- they need prayer, but they're down there. I would encourage you to take your spouse on a date and here and watch the African Children's Choir. It's $15 a person. It is a fundraiser. And so if you say, boy, I'd like to go and I, can't, I, don't, I just can't afford it. I don't have $15. Well, you have to tell right now and then to save $15. So that's my way of saying there, there's nothing free in this world. So <laughs> um, we want you to come, though. So please come. The African, African Children's Choir, they're just a wonderful group of kids, and they are so well-behaved. They are so amazing on stage. They sing amazing, and the moment it's done, they're all kids, and it's just Mexican jumping beans everywhere. They're just a lot of fun. I love it. So with that, um, turn in your Bibles to James 1, and then also take your Bible. If you have a, a bookmark in your, it's not saving how you're reading through the Bible in the year, put it in Psalms 1, or you could take one of your flyers from your bulletin and put it in Psalms 1. And we're going to jump back there to Psalms 1. Every week, Beth asks me, what's the sermon title? This is not my strong suit as a pastor, sermon title. What's your sermon title, Sean? I don't know. Every, and so she's like, I need, I'm printing these off. What's my sermon title? Well, here's kind of the gist of it this week. The Christian life is hard for everyone. Amen. So if it's not hard for you, you just haven't lived long enough. It will be. But trials, um, trials play no favorites. It picks on everybody. And we're going to look at that this morning. So I'm going to look at verses 9 through 11. I'm going to go through that first. And then I'm going to look at verse 12 through 15. In verses 9 through 11, there's two ways to interpret this. So if you hold to one, uh, I want you to know you're in great company. Uh, There's other people that would hold to what you believe. And then if you look at it the other way, I want you to know there's great company. I agree with that view. So you'll know which one it is that I'll, I'll share with you. So let's just read it together. Let the lowly brother boast in his exultation. So the first part, the first way to translate this is that the only person who is a believer who is a brother is the person who is in a lowly place. Now, the, the lowly brother in this place is a socioeconomic lowly. They're, they're just broke. They're, they're poor. 
They're just, they're, they don't know where their, their food's going to come from. And, and they are to, the lowly brother is to boast in his exaltation. And so the rich person, the first group would say the rich person is not a Christian. And the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he'll pass away. For the sun rises with his scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. And the reason that some people hold to this or they believe this is they say, well, I believe every dot and every tittle is there for a reason. Well, so do I. And because this literally says only the brother in the lowly place is a brother. And because it's literal, that's how I take it. And many of you here probably hold to a literal reading of the Bible, right? There's some, there's some heads nodding. Well, I want to share with you, you, you don't really do that. And, and here's just a, a survey here. Would, would you guys, all this is a, a participation with me. Would you take both your hands and put them right in front of you? Just take both hands, and I'm going to prove to you you're not a literalist. Okay? So if you say, yes, I am, I'm going to show you that you're not. Now, will you take your left hand and will you put it down? So that just your right hand is there. Now, if you have a right hand... You are not a literalist because Jesus literally said, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. So if you say, I hold to a literal translation of the Bible, you're not a literalist if you have a right hand. What it means is you read your Bible as literature and you read the text in the context and you understand there's different types of teachings. And what Jesus is really doing in that situation is he's saying you should take extreme measures so that you don't do that. Amen? Amen. So you're not a literalist. If you say, yes, I am, and, and you have a right hand or you have a right eye, um, if, if you got a right eye patch and you said, man, it was causing me to sin, so I just gouged it out because the word of God, I, k- kudos to you. I don't have that kind of faith. So here's the other way to interpret this. A lot of James's understanding comes from the book of Proverbs. The other way to interpret this is that both the poor and the rich are brothers. And so the reason that I would say that, I'll explain it to you why I hold to this. Now, if you want to hold to the other view that only the person in low position is a brother, you're in good company. That's great. I hold to this argument that both the poor and the rich are brothers. Because in Proverbs 22, 2, it says, the rich and the poor meet together. God made both. And God desires all men to be saved. And I think that the rich are included in the all men. Here's the other thing. Trials exist for both the poor and the rich. Now the poor person somehow thinks that if they had money, they would have fewer trials. But those of you who have money know for a fact that trials play, plays no favorites. You know, cancer doesn't look at your checkbook and say, oh, I can't touch him. They've got too much money. A child that dies from SIDS doesn't care how much is in your bank account. There's certain things that are beyond your control that it doesn't matter how much money you have. Trials exist for everyone. That's why I say the Christian life is hard for everybody. People think that if I just had this, no. And here's why. God wants the poor Christian and the rich Christian to grow up spiritually so they can joyfully reflect his nature and character in every circumstance of their life. The poor and the rich are both supposed to grow up. So let's walk through this. The lowly brother should boast in his exaltation. Well, why? Why? Why should he boast that he's broke or she's broke? Why, why should this person be happy? Well, for one, there is the constant daily reminder that they are absolutely, utterly dependent on God. Amen. They're praying, Lord, give us this day our daily bread because the cupboards are empty. And so there's a, an absolute reliance. But there's, here's what they can boast in their exaltation. You know, they can take comfort in the fact that they are a child of God. And if they're a child of God, 
then they are co-heirs with Christ. And if they are co-heirs with Christ, then they have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. You see, they realize that they are rich beyond measure. They may not have money in their bank account, but they are rich because they are a child of God. So they can boast in this. You can say whatever you want about me. My life can look like whatever you think you want it to look like, but I know that I know that I know that my faith is in Jesus Christ and I am his and he is mine and I'm a child of God. There is great comfort in that. And if you've been there and there's no food in the cupboard and there's no heat on because you can't pay the bills and, and you are frantic, the only thing you can take comfort in is that you are a child of God. The rich brother should boast in his humiliation. Well, what's that? Well, he should realize that money cannot solve every who needs God like the poor person. Money doesn't fix it. Money doesn't make it go away. Possessions cannot cover up the longing that you have for God. You can, go, you can chase after material things. There's a great book in the Bible. Uh, it, it's called Ecclesiastes. And here was a man who had more money than you could ever imagine. And he squandered it on every aspect of living that you could think of under the sun. And what he found at the end of it is that it was a chasing after the wind. It did not bring him satisfaction. So what's his Humiliation that he is no better than the poor person. They're on the same page. They are both absolutely, utterly dependent on God. Amen? Amen. So this first part here, trials exist for both. Now verse 11, you know, the sun rises with the scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls, its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. There's a warning here. If you have plenty of money in your checking account, there's, I met a person, I, don't, I, I was blessed when I met him and I was scratching my head, but they said, making money has never been a problem for me. And I think, wow, I wish I had that problem. Where making money was never a problem. They had more money than they knew what to do with. There's, here's, the, here's the warning. That you can somehow make that your God and that you would pursue that and that you would chase that. You know, what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I'm not smart enough to make that up. That's right from the word of God. Jesus said this, no one can serve two masters for he will either hate the one and love the other or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Matthew 19, 24, we know this one. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. So there is a strong warning here if you have plenty of money. So, verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trials. I just want to camp on this one right here. So we see a little bit in here, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trials. Here's the idea that, that you're supposed to remain in the, in the storm. Blessed is the man who, if, if you're having a hard time, let me tell you, when, when life is hard, it's not hard for 10 minutes. It's not hard for 20 minutes. It's not hard for 10 weeks. It's not hard for 20 weeks. When Jesus says, if any man comes after he must take up his cross daily and follow me. So sometimes trials last for a month, two months, a year, a decade, and a lifetime. And so here, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trials. Well, in my head, in Sean Newberry's head, I went to Psalm 1. So if I go sideways this morning, it's going to go here because these are my thoughts here and how it relates to James 1.12. What's that? I do. I'm going all over the place. All right, if you're tracking with me, great. 
Look at this, because you see here a man who remains steadfast under trials. There's a picture in Psalm 1 of a man who is steadfast under trials. So, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trials. Psalm 1 says, blessed is the man. That's how my mind went to Psalm 1. Blessed is the man, now this is, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. So the man who delights in the law of the Lord, this is a man that's blessed. And on his law, he meditates day and night. Now here's the picture of the steadfast person. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yield its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. So in my head, in Sean Newberry's head, I think of a a big cherry tree because when I was a little kid, right by our apartments, there was a huge cherry tree that I used to climb with my friend Jason, and we'd eat cherries. Now, I have to warn you, if you eat a lot of cherries, there's some negative consequences. (laughs) I didn't know that, but I learned that that day. But we spent all day in this huge cherry tree, and it was yielding its fruit in season. I want you to know the man who remains steadfast under trials is a man who is grounded, who is rooted in the Word of God. You cannot be steadfast in the middle of trials if you are not grounded and rooted in the Word of God. And so if you're going through hard times, my first question I would ask you, and you are saying it's overwhelming, it's very difficult, my first question to you would be, are you in the Word of God? Because if you're, you're not in the Word of God, the trial is going to seem overwhelming. It's going to seem bigger because you are not looking at God who is greater. We just sang that God of wonders beyond the galaxies. Just so you know, the, the God who is beyond the galaxies, he can fit the galaxies in the palm of his hand. That's a pretty big God. And so if you're not grounded and rooted in the Word of God, your trials are going to seem bigger than God. But if you're grounded and you're rooted in the Word of God, then you know for a fact that God is bigger than your trials. So blessed is the man. Not only is he grounded and rooted in it, he meditates on it day and night. He thinks about it constantly because his God is constantly bigger than his trials. Now, when it says that the man who is uh, why, or the blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord, not his law, he meditates day and night, like a tree planted by streams of water which yield its fruit in season. Let me explain what this means, which yield its fruit in season. Remember in James he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach. You remember that? Well, yielding its fruit in season is the idea of exercising wisdom at the right time. You know that there is a, a time and a season for everything under the sun. Again, I'm back to Ecclesiastes. You've got to follow my super ADD mind bouncing all over. But there is a time and a place for everything. And the one who yields its fruit in season knows when and what to say and how to say it, where to say it, knows what to do at the right time. Do you know the person that does the right thing at the wrong time? And you think, man, they're not very wise. The person who yields its fruit in season has wisdom. And and James is telling us that we should have wisdom. And when it says his leaf does not wither, all that that's saying is, is that tree shows that it has life. And so if you're grounded and you're rooted and you're anchored in the word of God and life is coming at you and there's trials and you're saying, Lord, I need wisdom, one of the best places you can go for godly wisdom is God's word. And then you can exercise it at the right time. So that's what it is. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trials. You know who cannot endure trials? It's still in Psalm 1. People who walk in the counsel of wicked cannot endure trials. People who stand with those whose preference is sin, they cannot endure. Those who sit with those who mock and belittle God's holiness, they cannot stand firm in the middle of trials. You know, I, when I was a kid, my coach would tell me, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And there's a lot of truth in that. The Bible says it this way, if you walk with the wise, you'll grow wise. But if you hang out with a bunch of fools, you'll be foolish. 
So back to James. For when he has stood the test, he'll receive the crown of life. Now, this isn't a kingly crown that we think of. This is the Olympic crown that would be more of a bunch of leaves. It's the crown that that the apostle Paul says that he is striving after, that he is straining after, that he treats his spiritual life like an Olympian disciplines his body. He doesn't chase or he doesn't run aimlessly. He fixes his eyes on Jesus Christ and he is pursuing holiness. He is pursuing God and he is relentless because at the end he says, I fought the good fight. I ran the race. He never took his eyes off of Jesus Christ and he was ready for the prize. That's the type of crown that we're talking about here. Not a kingly crown. The blessing, the consequence for those who are steadfast is life abundantly and life eternal. Now look at verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. God doesn't lead us to sin. God is calling us to holiness. And there's a sense in which you get so scared because life is overwhelming. I could lose my house. I could lose everything that I have. And you you, you begin to pray, but you start praying sideways. And here's what I mean by that. I've done this before, too. You're, You're in good company. If you've done this, if you're not, I want to be like you, but you're praying, Lord, Lord, please, I need this. And while you're praying, you're planning on what you can do. So you're saying, Lord, I trust you. I trust you. And over here, you're going, Lord, I need to do this. God doesn't lead you into sin. He always calls you into holiness. God's answer to his prayers will always reflect his nature and his character. Always. And if you feel that somehow you've been in the middle of a trial and this is coming sideways and, and you think this is an answer to God's prayer, let me ask, does it call you to holiness? Now here's the other thing that I see. People justify it so easy. Well, God said, hmm, you know what? The scriptures are complete. You know what I mean by that? If you want to know what he said, it's right here. And if you really feel that God's speaking to you and it doesn't reflect this and it doesn't go along this, there's another voice you're you're listening to and it's the voice of a liar, the voice of the father of all lies. You better be careful who you listen to because God's answer will always call you to holiness. The devil is a liar. And some of the most pathetic people I have ever met are people who believe their own lies to justify their own sin. Now there's genuine pity on my part, but their delight in their deliberate disobedience is also disgusting to me. And so in that aspect, I say it's it's pathetic. Let me tell you something. This is not anything new. I'm gonna share with you three things. Life is hard. If you're taking notes and you don't know this, you can write this down. Life is hard. Life is not fair. There is no place in God's economy for easy. Let me say that last one again. There is no place in God's economy for easy. I think one of our problems is is that we we look around. I think Facebook and Twitter, those things are great things. They're great ways to stay updated on friends and family and what's going on. But sometimes, you know, when our life is miserable and we feel like we're going through hell and we're on Facebook and we see, man, they're in Italy. Man, they're they're, they're on vacation on a white sandy beach. Oh, their life is so good. This isn't fair. This is not fair. I deserve. I should have. When I was a kid, my grandmother would tell me, usually by holding my hair or my ear, mind your own business. Did you ever hear that phrase, mind your own business? You know who said that phrase that I love? His name's Jesus. Now let me share with you Jesus' mind your own business story because Jesus says mind your own business. There is a a guy named Peter. 
And if you know who Peter is, he was a rough guy around the edges. He was a fisherman. Uh, He loved Jesus, but he denied Jesus three times. Right before he died, he denied him. He said, Lord, I will never deny you. And he denied him three times. And then Jesus dies and he raises from the dead and he says, go get Peter. Now you got to understand the march of shame for Peter as he's coming back to Jesus. And they have this little conversation. He asks Peter three times, do you love me? And then he tells Peter, you know, you saw me suffer and you saw me die. And the same thing is going to happen to you. Now this is where I like Peter because I'm a lot like Peter. You know what Peter says and does in that moment? He looks over at John, Jesus' favorite. And he says, what about him? And Jesus says, mind your own business. He literally says this, what is that to you? And you know, sometimes when you're in your pity party and someone else's life is going better and you think I deserve or... What is that to you? God has a plan. God has a purpose. Your trial is not unique to you. It is given to you by a father who loves you and has a plan and a purpose to grow you up that you might reflect the nature and character of Christ in every circumstance of your life. And if you want to cut and run in the middle of the trial, you're not trusting the father who loves you. And you can look around and you can look and see, but you know what? They have their own future knot hole. Or they've already been through their knothole. God has already grown them up. What is that to you? When, when, so we're in the middle of a trial and we think, well, I don't want to go through this. And you cut and run. That's quitting. No one respects the person who seeks the easiest way possible in the middle of trials. Let me say that again. No one respects the person who chooses the easiest way possible in the middle of trials. Parents, do you want your kids to respect you? Then you need to be steadfast in the middle of trials. You need to endure it for the sake of God's purpose so that your children will be steadfast. But your children will respect you. Who are the heroes of our faith? Job is a hero of my faith. Was he steadfast in the middle of trials? Oh, yeah. You know, he did say, I'd like a word with God. And then he got that and he had nothing to say. God showed up and he said, I have have absolutely nothing, God. I don't know why I said that. I don't know why I thought that. I had no idea what I meant when I said it. Joseph is a hero of my faith scripturally. Did Joseph endure trials again and again and again and again? The weeping prophet, Jeremiah, did he endure trials? How would you like to be thrown in the septic tank? He was, because he was obedient to God. John the Baptist. You know, Peter did suffer like Jesus, and he did die on a cross like Jesus, but he said, you know what, I'm not worthy to die like Jesus. Would you please hang me upside down on the cross? He suffered And he died. And even John was imprisoned on an island. You know, mine is a woman named Susan Christian. Maybe you know Susan Christian. Her dad was a pastor, went to student, was a student at Multnomah years ago. Her dad pastored the last church that I was at. She has MS. She's in a wheelchair. And her, her health is going downhill, but she refuses to let MS define her. Instead, she chooses joy every single day. And when I see her, she is always smiling. I have coffee with her husband, and she says, you know what, Sean, it's the real deal. It's the real deal. I am amazed at her joy in the Lord. And John says, you know, I have to serve her in very humbling and humiliating ways. And all she does is says, please and thank you, and I love you. She is a hero in the faith. She has stood steadfast for the Lord. Praise the Lord on that one. Amen. My friend Pepper, who introduced me to my wife. Pepper married a a wonderful woman named Stephanie. Stephanie was an editor for Multnomah Press for years, and then Multnomah Press sold off, and she was an editor uh, for a lot of Christian writers. And she had brain cancer. 
She suffered for five years with that. She had two little boys, beautiful boys, Sawyer and Calvin. And the Lord called her home. And I went to her funeral, and I gave Pepper a big hug. And I said, Pepper, if there's anything you need, please let me know. And he said this. He said, God doesn't give a rip about our flesh. He's concerned about our hearts. And he wants us to love him. And he will take us through anything so that he is all that remains. And I thought, you know, Pepper, that's so true. I'm going to share that with a lot of people. And I have been. You see, there are heroes of my faith. Pepper could have cut and run. He could have said, I didn't sign up for this. He could have left his wife. He could have left his kids. He could have said, this is too hard. I had a professor at Multnomah. His name was Tim Aldridge, Dr. Joe's brother. He had a daughter that was born blind. And his wife said, you know what? I didn't sign up for this. I'm out of here. She cut and she ran and she walked away from God. And there might be someone here this morning who is in the middle of trials and you're thinking, man, I need to cut and run. I need to get out of here. I don't, I don't deserve this. Yes, you need this. God loves you and he has a plan for you. And he wants you to keep your eyes fixed on him because he is going to do something far more uh, greater than you could ever imagine with your tragedy tragedy. I know it because that's how God works in his economy. God works all things together for good. If it's not good, he's not done yet. Keep waiting. 1 Corinthians 10:13 says this. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So you can't say, God caused me to do this. No, God always provides a way out. It's just that you stop looking at God and you keep looking at sin. The difference between the person who is steadfast and the one who feels compelled to sin is the one who is steadfast sees God as more beautiful and wonderful than the sin that tempts them. They keep Christ in front of them. They keep the gospel near to them. They realize that Jesus died for them. And in dying for them, he actually purchased them with his blood. They no longer live, but they live for Christ. That's the difference between the person who endures. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. So verse 14, each of you is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Let me share with you something about the desires of your heart. Scripture speaks about this. The Old Testament says the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Who can understand it? Ephesians 4.22 says you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self because your old self was being corrupted by its deceitful desires and you have to be made new in the attitude of your mind. So that's why I say the person who is steadfast is anchored and grounded and rooted in the word of God because the word of God is renewing their mind. Mind. And so the person whose mind is not renewed, they're following desires that are deceitful. So that's very important. So the Bible tells us that our desires are deceitful. You think your solution is a good solution, but a solution that does not call you to holiness as God is holy will only lead to death. Why do I say that? Because, well, look at verse 15. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Now that death doesn't have to be a physical death, though it might be. Death is separation. And if you're following your desires and their deceitful desires, those desires could lead to sin, and that sin can lead to the destruction of a marriage. It could lead to the destruction of a family. It could lead to the destruction of your employment. You could lose your friends. You can destroy your hopes and dreams. Jesus said this, the devil comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. He says, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Pursuing sin is a pursuit of the devil who is a liar And he will only lead you to death. Pursuing holiness in Christ will result in life. You know, when a husband and a wife pursue Christ, 
the life in that marriage is beautiful and full. When parents and children are pursuing holiness in Christ, the life in that family is beautiful and full. When a church pursues holiness in Christ, the life of the church is beautiful and full. And I tell you, I want to pastor a church that is filled with the life of Christ. I want to pastor men and women who want a deeper, fuller life in Christ. I want to see people reap the rewards of faithfully following Jesus through all of life's trials and tribulations. I want to encourage men and women to live for the glory of God and enjoy him forever. And so you will hear me constantly point you to Jesus so that you may become like Jesus, so that you can joyfully reflect his nature and his character in every circumstance of your life. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you know each one of us so well that you have specific trials that you have designed for each one of us that we might follow you and trust you and live for you. That you are teaching us how to die to ourselves. You're showing us what it means to take up our cross daily, that we might be like Christ, that we might say, not my will, but thine. Father, I pray that you would encourage hearts this morning for people who are going through trials that you would let them know that you love them, that you care about them, that you see their needs, that you haven't left them, you haven't abandoned them. Father, if there's anyone here who is tempted to pursue sin, who is temp- tempted to cut and run, I pray, Father, that they would be encouraged to be steadfast, that they might see Jesus as more beautiful than the sin. They might recognize that you love them that you sent your only son to die for them. Father, that they might realize that you own them and Jesus would be Lord. Father, we thank you for your words of encouragement, that your eyes are looking to and fro throughout the earth, that you may give strong support to those whose hearts are completely yours. Father, if there's someone here this morning whose heart isn't completely yours, I pray that in the stillness of their being, they would surrender themselves to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.